So AI changed a lot of things and let me show you how I use it for 3D development and spatial AI direction. Essentially, it's a catalyst to have a better rate at innovation. And this is something that is very important, but you see a lot on articles that it does not give a lot of boost for productivity. And you have this article also that says that colleagues get annoyed by receiving always purely generated AI content that has no soul, that has no depth, and that is really not impactful. So how do we move around that? And I want to tune it for 3D coding and creating innovation. So this is especially useful if you are a solopreneur or if you are the head of a company uh, R&D direction and you want really to tune things by putting your hands into the mud and not staying on only on the managerial position. So um, there are three core pillars that are already talked about. There is the domain knowledge that is important to have, the data knowledge and the algorithm knowledge. So these are the three main blocks that we really need to develop early on, especially in the role if you are in a direction role or if you are leading a company or if you have a small group of researchers that you want to, to fit into uh, some direction. This is super key. If you are before this stage, it is also absolutely essential to develop a very good expertise in a specific domain, in a vertical, to have an algorithm expertise as to which algorithm you choose for which uh, task. For example, if you want to segment a scene, will you go with a DBK scan clustering or a region growing, or will you use a new semantic segmentation architecture? And data knowledge, how will you deal with sensor input and how will you orchestrate the full pipeline here from uh, input to something that you can use in decision-making scenario? So these are the three main pillars that I believe are central before going into using AI. This is very hard to delegate, and this is something that you should really play onto. So the second thing is, it's important to have also context knowledge about a specific application or a case where it will work or not work, and have the, what I will call, system one plus two um, coding. What is that? System one is really you define a set of rules, and you will uh, give that to the computer and it will execute on it. And system two is instead of creating the rules, you provide data and you hope the computer will make the rules for you. Usually this is with supervised learning or neural network. And the system three is now we code in English vibe coding and we hopefully pray to have something. And <laughs> you can go the extreme, um, extreme path where you refuse to actually write a single line of code yourself. Okay, so I will talk about that, especially right now. And to go there, um, I have seven steps that I believe are very important if you want to design fruitful innovation and invention that would stand the test of time, but with a higher rate than if you would do that only with system one or two, as we did before. So the first thing that is important is to go onto your system design. And I will show you just right now how I do that. I developed a little um, application to help me design the systems. And I added that as part of the Freeletic community that I'm building. So here is the little tool with AI that I uh, created. So here is my DB scan clustering. That's the topic that I want for urban object segmentation in point clouds with Python. Um, what it does is generate a workflow and you can see that I have it interactive. So you have various steps. This is the first steps and all the time I describe what I have, the input and the output. Next step process, pre-process point cloud. So that's what uh, we are going to do. After that, segment ground plane, that makes sense. Optimal dbscan parameter makes sense. Here, applying dbscan clustering, very good. We refine the cluster, we extract the boundaries, and we visualize and evaluate. And after that, the workflow is complete. So what I can do is download as markdown or the image of the complete workflow and move around if I want to the various stages. So that's one example where it's uh, nice to have a system design that works very good because it's very clear with anyone that wants to see what's happening, if there is something missing or not. And if we are not happy, we edit um, the steps or we add one or we add the branch. This is a simple example. But you see how system design thinking is super powerful in this kind of uh, scenarios. Okay, so that's the most uh, crucial stuff that we need to lock in. Then we move on to the second stage. And the second stage is prompt engineering. So you, you already have seen a lot of talk about that. I used to overlook it, uh, but especially now it's, I don't know if you can associate it like a Python syntax or, or things like this. This goes deeper than this because if the set of restriction is not properly formatted, you may miss out on this. 
So the good news is that you can alleviate any prompt engineering with um, tools that will create prompt that are better structured for your engine. Usually what I recommend, especially if you start out at this stage, is to feed anything as a markdown file, right? And try to output that also as a markdown file. And if you stay in this ecosystem, this will allow you to leverage um, API or directly Python to generate this and to, to also read what you have as an output. So this is the part of prompt engineering, really defining exactly what you want. So if I'm taking, again, the case of segmentation that makes may make things clear, the system design would be, okay, how um, can I go into urban object segmentation using uh, dbscan clustering? My system design will really be the various steps I go through. My input is a PLY file. Then I uh, pass it to voxelization and sampling. Then I will move on to pre-processing and extracting already very big noise that I don't want. Then I move on to plain extraction with more for logical filters. And after that, I will apply dbscan, put the labels on various clusters um, and extract the oriented bounding box. And then finally create 3D model of each individual object, for example, okay? so. I will fit uh, this system into my prompt engineering system that will create something that is very relevant for uh, my AI agent or my AI uh, chat to answer. Then the third thing that is very important to have is um, knowing uh, how to talk with the machine. So your prompt is one thing, but it's very key or central, let's say, that we move beyond that and we know exactly how to best approach if there is something that you need to modify or if there is something that is not working or putting constraints in place. These kind of things are very key. And today, we have the space to do that with AI. You have context windows, uh, you can refer chats, you can have access to internet. All these kind of things is very important to master to be able to use that to the best of uh, its ability, let's say. Okay, so after that, once you have something that looks like it's working. So now it provided for me a code structure that fits exactly my template and on top that perfectly answer what I want him to answer. I will go into the four step that I will call a debug refine. So of course, especially today, may not hold true for uh, 10 years, but especially today, you cannot take for granted whatever is spit out from your AI uh, model. At the moment I'm talking, I believe the most um, proficient one for code and a 3D code is Claude. Uh, there, there is the new Sonnet 4.5, which brings some new functionality, but you, you know the, um, the the pace of innovation, we don't really know here. We may be at the peak of inflated expectation um, from the Gartner cycle. So be careful there. I think we will stay in this phase for a long time. And it's important because this is where you will have a lot of expertise, especially if you have all your domain data algorithm knowledge, context is sem one and two. You take the code and this is where you inject your expertise. All of that goes here to make the most promising solution ever. So essentially what that does is that instead of going without that a prompt and AI communication and having something output, this is the new stuff that you do with AI, okay? All the rest stays the same. So essentially, if you want to use AI as a rate accelerator, this is what needs to be super efficient. If you want to have it as a new knowledge creation, be very careful <laughs> at this stage. So this is why today I think it's still super relevant to uh, be an expert somewhere or to know exactly what you're talking about, All right? At least in in the position where you want to direct a, a team on R&D effort or if you're a researcher and engineer, okay? So once that is done, the debugging and the refinement, this is where we go into the extent. The extent, you can also delegate that to AI, but especially for my work uh, on the various aspects. So whenever I consult uh, with companies in the Fortune 500 of French Tech 120, I'm always there. I need always to extend. So it's very rare actually in my work that I will leverage AI for a massive tax. Usually it may save me one or two hours in the day, but maximum. The rest is here. And delegating creative scientific process to AI, this is shooting, uh, let's say, a bullet in your feet. And the second thing is today, we need to design systems that are cutting edge. And of course, to design cutting edge stuff using AI, it means AI need to be trained on cutting edge stuff. And when we talk about 3D data, voxel point cloud meshes, there are not a lot of training code data accessible. So if you want to ask him, okay, create a transformer architecture for 3D point clouds from scratch, 
it will never be able to do that or, or use Poinet for this specific um, task with my custom class, it will fail um, really, really badly. And also, if you ask region growing, uh, th this kind of thing that are more advanced because you want to use specific features and, and such, it will fail as well. So the extent usually, this is your uh, creative process and good, good, good side because that's actually what I believe is the most fun part uh, with uh, R and D work and innovation. It's actually creating new things, creating new approaches to solve a specific problem. This is fantastic. This is where I take most of my uh, passion out of uh, what I'm doing. Okay, so after that, once all of that is done, it's working, fully functional. Okay, this is only at this stage that you go into automation, automate. All right, so if you automate before, again, you shoot your other feet with a bullet. Automation does need to arrive not too early on. Usually you need to make sure that you have that applied for this uh, specific number of cycles. If you are in production, make sure that you get enough feedback. Okay, uh, statistically at least, and then you start automating things. If you start to automate too early on, uh, this is not good because you will spend a lot of time creating all the automation. And if at the end you build the segmentation system and the metrics are not at all what your clients want, what are you doing? Are you still sending him the automation with a bad segmentation? Or uh, if you want to redo everything and the input output are not the same, it's very different. If you need to change also the modular architecture, this is very different. So. The good news is that once the automation is done, we can move on to the final stage, which is deliver or ship. All right, and here, this is something that will get overlooked by almost all coders that I know that are absolutely stunning at all the rest. Whenever we go into the GUI and the UX and thinking about how to best use it, this is where it hurts. So from the get-go, if you can, on top of that, have kind of a founder mentality and, and a do-it-all mentality, it doesn't mean that you will be good everywhere, but you will arrive to a certain prototype that you are actually not ashamed to show and that will be able to deliver also on the graphical interface aspect of things. So there, my recommendation is, especially today with AI, if you use anything online, so two uh, comes up on my mind, it will be lovable, and uh, Fire Studio, but you have also Replit and you have other ones. These are the full stack, let's say, uh, cloud-based solution for AI agents. They will work very nicely with uh, React, with uh, JavaScript, new framework, um, with front-end stuff. Whenever you deal with back-end, only Lovable is, is pretty decent at it, but usually it will not hold the test of time. And if you want to integrate Python loops and API and so on, this is a bit more trickier and it's good if you actually don't rely too much on AI at this stage. I think it's good that you create your own kind of templates. You can use AI to help you create a very premium-like template, uh, front-end based. You create your, your, your back-end routine to, to generate your um, MySQL or uh, any other database that will hold what you need to, to have. My recommendation, if it's anything special, is of course PostgreSQL. And once that is done, you make sure that you can fit that into the loop. And what I do, for example, is I developed a small, um, very small GUI that allows to share with uh, some people in various team. Instead of using the CLI, which can be a bit obscure for some people, they will have this graphical interface. They will be uh, able to load the script. And what it would do, the script is just launch with an input data, result in a viewer and validation or not based on uh, what the script is executing. So in the case of segmentation here, uh, it's okay, you feed the script, uh, someone in the technical team will feed a point cloud, it will go through the script, output a 3D visualization interactive to look around, show the final um, output file with the labels, and at the end, just wait for the feedback of the technician or the engineer behind it to validate or not the good execution. And this way, you, you have something that feeds uh, the complete system loop is finished while you have the feedback. And this is super, super important. Okay, so that's pretty much it for me. I just wanted to share some thoughts about how I move around designing new innovation with 3 data science and spatial AI in the age of AI. If you want to go deeper, because this is uh, to give you an overview and open up fully new ideas for you about how, how to move around things, I highly recommend that you check out just um, down below the resources, especially 
the offered course on the full roadmap to create uh, innovation and invention. If there is code that you want to test out just below, I share a tutorial. And after that, I will encourage you to bond on one of the course track that I offer if you want to build all this and to be able to do this. All right. So see you in the next video. Bye bye.